he wasn't, uh, he was telling them he was a Christian, but he wasn't really a Christian. Because that's how it, he was acting like a Christian was how he was getting fed and housed and everything. <laughs> and then he had a big encounter with God and really became a Christian. And after that happened, the, the fireworks took off. So if you look at that in your life, you know, if you, if you just casually want to be a Christian or you really want to be a Christian and, and um, go through a discipleship. And, but the main thing is... Uh, yeah, seeking what the Lord wants you to do, and, and, lay, and you know, it's laying down your life for the Lord. And um, and if I was your age again, I, I'd definitely turn to the Lord much stronger than I did. Uh, I had things happen to me. My, my, my best friend, um, uh, he was murdered over cocaine dealing when he was 23, and he found his body about his head. And so I had things like that happen to me uh, because of associates I had in my wild life. So it took me my 20s, my whole 20s, to really be discipled and uh, come to the Lord. And um, I moved to Kauai in 79 when I was 29. So that's when I, I really got solid with the Lord. Anyway, enough about me. But. Um, so when my book came out, I, I, um, they, they ran a story about how I wrote the book in the Honolulu newspaper. And that, that this, so when you um, step out for the Lord, this came, sort of came out of nowhere. And things start happening like this. And I'm pretty much a surfer from Kauai. And the week after next, I'm, I'm, being, I'm spending a week at Yale University being hosted by Yale University, which is totally crazy. You know, I have a BA in English. I'm not some scholar or something. But the Lord opens doors like that for you. So these are, um, I'm going to leave, uh, donate these to your library downstairs. So when I'm God, you can look at them. But this is, you know, the word story about Obukaiya and how the Bible, how the Christianity came to Hawaii. And this is the, um, you know, the, the, the picture version of it. Okay, and this is my latest book, Preparing the Way. Okay, so this is just a statement about Obukaiya. Um, so he invited the churches in New England to send him and missionaries to Hawaii. So he was the seed of the Hawaii mission, the founding of this Kauai Hau church, the, the mother church of Hawaii. Um, so this is, Lucy Thurston was um, a, a, a missionary wife that came on the first uh, ship of missionaries. And this is 50 years later. And she's talking about Obukaya. See, Obukaya was how they said his name in America. Obukaya is his Hawaiian name, but it turned into Obukaya, Henry Obukaya. Uh, and there is such a young Hawaiian who went to America to learn of true Christianity that he might return and teach his countrymen. He and three or four other Hawaiians were taught in the mission school in Cornwall, Connecticut. It was their arrival and appeal to Christians in America that led those who embarked in the Brig Thaddeus to devote themselves to missions. So in the, in the community here, you'll hear a lot of bad things about the missionaries, you know, destroyed the island, stole the land, and so forth. And most people don't realize that Hawaiians actually sent the missionaries to Hawaii. So this is a really big point. So this is Henry. Um, so he was born, it's, um, have any of you ever been to the big island by the volcano? No? Okay. So that's the other side of the Hawaiian Islands from us, okay? So he grew up in a, a pretty, uh, prim it's still pretty primitive today, this black sand beach uh, in Hawaii Island. Um, and he was born in 1787, right after the end of the Revolutionary War in America. So what happened was um, we had a king named Kamehameha. He was the conqueror, and he, he, he battled all across the Hawaiian Islands. So he was over on Oahu, taking control of Oahu, and uh, they had a lot of civil wars. So a, 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 a Hawaiian, one Hawaiian group on the north end of the big island came down while he was away, and they, they took over Hilo and different places. And his, his, his family, his father was sort of a a soldier in the, uh, in, the, in the side against Kamehameha. So Kamehameha sent his uh, top warriors to fight this little army. And um, they were defeated. And uh, when the Hawaiians went to battle, their families would come alongside to uh, give them water and food. And if somebody gets injured, they drag them off the battlefield. And Kamehameha ordered, uh, not, ordered his men to slaughter not just the army, but all the men, women, and children, too because he, he wanted the end of wars in Hawaii. So this was the last war that Kamehameha fought. So, his, so Obukaya, was, he was 10 years old, and he had his little brother, 
and his parents were, um, took them and they, they hid in a cave, like the cave we saw yesterday. Remember the, 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 uh, the docent there was telling about um, how people would hide there in time of wars in the cave? So that's what they did, they were in a cave, but, but the warriors found them and brought them out. And if you look back here, they, um, they used shark, shark tooth uh, uh, weapons to uh, slice his parents in pieces. So he's traumatized by that and he grabbed his little brother and ran away. And they speared his little brother and knocked him to the ground. And they looked at him and said, oh, he was 10 years old. And they said he's, uh, they, they kept him alive because he was uh, too, too uh, small to create trouble, but big enough to be a slave for them, to, to do work for them. So the warrior took him to the north shore of a big island and made him you know, like a household slave. Um, and he was the guy that murdered his parents. Imagine how traumatic that was. So fortunately, um, Obukai's uncle was the head priest of this heiau um, on Kealikakua Bay in a big island. And that's where Captain Cook had arrived. And he spotted him with it being held captive and freed him and brought him down to the other part of the island where he, he was head of the temple. Um, and he, he began the apprenticeship to be trained as a kahuna. But he really didn't want that. He was a really curious boy and I think he had photographic memory so in training as a kahuna, you have to be able to chant all night long without repeating yourself, histories and genealogies, and really, it's like being a monk. Yeah. Kahuna Kahuna's a priest. It's like a, a shaman or, a, you know. Um, so he, so he, he really didn't want to do that. From, so from the time he was 10 till about, about 10 years, he was, he was in training. But at Kealikakua, a lot of Western ships came in and sailors would come on the beach and they'd tell stories about faraway places. So he was really interested about, doing, about getting away. So in 1808, he was offered um, a, a job as a sailor on a ship from New Haven in Connecticut. And um, so he swam out to the ship and was invited on board and took off to head, head, for, um, to head, head for America. And where he first went was, um, he went off, off, the, uh, off Baja, this place called Guadalupe Island. And uh, this place is like the home of the great white sharks. I know you've ever heard of Guadalupe. And so the sea captain from New England, they were killing fur seals. And they take their skins and take them to China and trade them for tea and silk and then bring that back to New York City and sell it. And you make a fortune, make a, you, know, you, really, you really score a lot of money, a lot of money involved. So they weren't just killing 10 or 20 fur seals, they were killed 50,000. And so they would have a dozen guys of clubs, club the seal, skin it, stretch the skin out to dry, and do that for about six months, load the ship up, and then head for China. So, so the sea captain left about half his men on Guadalupe, and this is you know, right off San Diego, and came back to Hawaii for supplies, and that's where he picked up Obakaya. So they came back there. So the first place, uh, Obukaye, and his, he had a sidekick named Hopu, a little 13-year-old Hawaiian. First place they went was to Baja, believe it or not. So they came, left there and came back to Hawaii. And um, they were offered to, uh, you know, they could get off if they wanted in Hawaii, but they wanted to keep moving. So there's a Hawaiian expression called holo holo. And that means you ever go like on a road trip or go cruising around without a, no, no purpose, just for fun. That's what holo holo is. So th literally thousands of native, young native Hawaiian men took off from Hawaii in the early 1800s and went all over the world. So he went on the ship and they, they headed for China to, to trade, uh, trade the seal for uh, the fur seals for uh, tea and uh, silks and different things. And fortunately on board was a Yale graduate um, and he was about your age. His name was Russell Hubbard and so he was taking time off. He finished up his divinity degree. And he was taking time off and went to, went, to see, went to see an adventure around the world sailing. And then he was going to be a minister. And on board, he taught Obukai the basics of English and began witnessing to him. So the Lord and the sea captain was a Christian too. The sailors weren't, <laughs> but the captain and one of the, one of the crewmen were. So God put him in, in, his, in his place. And he had a little thing called a Westminster Catechism. You know, you ever, guys ever seen one of those? It's um, 
a basic little, the basics of Christianity they used to use in those days to teach children. So that's when his, his first knowledge of Christ was on, on board the ship. Now Russell Hubbard, he, he sort of got the bug about the sea and kept going out on voyages. And in 1810, he and his brother were off Bermuda and their, their ship wrecked and he died. He's, he died on a shipwreck of his brother when he was about 24, 25. So he, so he didn't follow the Lord, follow the Lord's path. He went off on worldly pleasures and didn't make it. <laughs> so this is uh, Canton, China. So they would stop there for three to six months. And uh, these are all ships from around the world that were, t they were bringing furs to China and then trading them for uh, silk and teas and uh, Chinaware, which would be brought back to London, to New York, to Paris and places and sold for big money. And they would take the masks down and, and the sailors would all work on the ships while they were in China. So finally, they went across the Indian Ocean, went, went past Java, uh, around the South Africa, up the Atlantic, and he landed, landed first in New York City and then went up to New Haven because the sea captain, Captain Britnell, lived in New Haven. So he invited him home for, he thought he was just gonna stay for a little while and catch the next ship back to Hawaii. And again, he was brilliant. You know, he probably had a photographic memory and he'd been trained as a kahuna. And here he is in, at Yale University on the, door, on the steps of Yale University. And he was, um, he saw all the, because um, he and his buddies, that's where all the, the young guys were hanging out. They played they play sort of like a game of baseball in front of Yale. And they went there to hang out and talk story and play games and stuff. And then he realized that they were carrying these books like this. And he realized he couldn't read them, you know. And all the, he knew the knowledge was in the books. So, he, so he, one day he just got despondent. And um, so the jacket he has on was made out of seal skins. He brought that from China, and he, he had tar on him, and he was like, almost like homeless. And he was, so he started weeping on the steps of Yale, and this one student named Edwin Dwight showed up. And he, he um, comforted him and invited him to come and be tutored and join them in their, in their dorm rooms to learn some English and, and to you know, begin to be, be friends. Now again, this is God's hand and everything, because Edwin Dwight, um, he grew up with the Mohican Indians, you know, the movie The Last of the Mohicans, you ever see that? Up in, Mass in Western Massachusetts. And that was the Wild West in those days. So of all the students at Yale, he was, you know, um, accustomed to, uh, to you know, being in community with indigenous people. So um, he became a close friend of Obakai and got along on the, you know, the beginning of his uh, pilgrimage as a Christian. Now, back in 1806, up in Williams College, which is the very northwest tip of uh, Massachusetts, they had a really important uh, prayer meeting. It was called the Haystack Meeting. And uh, there was revivals going on in New England at this time. A lot of the churches, were, you know, uh, dozens and dozens of people were becoming born-again Christians. So at the Haystack Meeting, um, see, nobody in America at this time was going on foreign missions. They had missions to the Indian tribes, but not, not to, not to like India or Hawaii or places. So these students got together during a lightning storm and they, 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 were in the, they used a haystack for cover and um, prayed for foreign missions. And this, this began, began the whole American missionary movement and led to the missionaries coming to Hawaii. So um, in 1809, Samuel Mills, who was the leader of the Haystack meeting, showed up at Yale. And he had created a, um, a secret society called the Brethren. So um, young men would join, and you almost like sign your name in blood. I, I've seen the original roster of, 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 the, of, the, of the students that signed up. And you dedicated your life to going off on a foreign mission, you know. And then it, it lasted until about 1860, and you go through the roster, and about half the guys died in the mission field that, that na whose names are on the roster. So Mills uh, went to Yale as a, stu to, as a graduate student, but really to recruit people for the Brethren to become interested in going on foreign missions. So he met Obokaya in Edwin Dwight's dorm room, and this is um, the Connecticut Hall at Yale, and that's where, that's where Edwin's room was. And 2017, these are descendants of Obokaya's family. We went; to, they had a, a Obokaya day at Yale, and we made the front page of the newspaper. That's my little Obokaya book you saw in the beginning there. 
So Mills, uh, the light bulb went off in Mills' head, and he saw that they should send a mission to the Sandwich Islands, which was what Hawaii was called. Now, why they called the Sandwich Islands was because Lord Sandwich in England was the man that put the money up for Captain Cook's voyages. So he named Hawaii the Sandwich Islands off the source of his funding for his uh, trip. <clears throat> so um, this is uh, Andover, well, it used to be Andover Seminary in Andover, Massachusetts. Today it's Phillips Academy at Andover. And this was the first seminary built in America. And the building was modeled after Yale. And this became the center of, uh, of training foreign missionaries in America. And Obukaiya ended up staying in the dorm room with, with uh, Edwin Dw of, uh, Samuel Mills. And so this is sort of what, what he, how his education went. He, he uh, was tutored at uh, Samuel Mills' home, and then he went to an academy. He actually went with K to 12 kids for a while and got his basic education and then took off after a while and began to learn Greek and um, he, learned, he learned Hebrew and eventually he translated the book of Genesis from Hebrew into the Hawaiian language. It was the first written Hawaiian language. Um, then he, he went to an, another academy and then the, uh, eventually he went to a place called, they built a foreign mission school in Cornwall, Connecticut to train him and other uh, uh, students to, to take the gospel back, back to their home countries. So this is um, 1816, this is what he was studying. So he studied English grammar, uh, so he, he can parse sentences, means he can tell you know, the noun, verb, and so forth. Knowledge and geography, arithmetic, through the fundamental rules, the rule of three and interests, Euclid's elements of geometry, um, and with, by his own exertions without any particular instruction, he has acquired knowledge of Hebrew. He has read several chapters in the Hebrew Bible and translated portions of them into his own language. He manifests a taste for the Hebrew language and is much pleased to study it. So when he, um, so Christians sort of surrounded him once he got out of New Haven, but he was sort of playing along because again, I, I said he was, they were housing him, feeding him and so forth. But you know, he sort of got some glimmers of Christianity, but he, he was, and then he, he said his first prayer in front of some people at Andover and still unconverted. And finally he was baptized in 1814 and 1814 to 16, he really took off as a Christian. But I'll show you what happened here. So in 1812, so Samuel Mills, the founder of foreign missions in America, became like his big brother. And Mills took off on a, um, a church planning Bible distribution tour on horseback from Connecticut to the Mississippi River down to New Orleans. And he, he sent Obukaiya to a, a Christian town in New Hampshire. And there he ca caught a fever and almost died. And the Christians took really good care of him and loved him. And, and that's when the Lord really uh, uh, turned his life around. And that's where he really became a born again Christian was in this home here in New, ha in New Hampshire. <clears throat> and by 1816, he landed in uh, this, this county called Litchfield. So what was happening there was um, there was a, a, the Second Great Awakening had broken out in America, and it was like a, a really big time of revival, and foreign missions started, uh, women's rights, uh, prison reform, anti-slavery movement. The anti-slavery movement came out of the Christian church, you know, not out of, it wasn't, initially it wasn't political. So in, these, in the main towns on the coast, the, the wealthy towns, the churches didn't want this act, act, activism. They didn't want this, you know, people going out on, on missions and everything. And so they were firing the, the pastors in, in, in the bigger cities. And, up here, and out in the country here, they were very accepting of this new theology. So a lot of the more brilliant pastors ended up here in Litchfield and north, north there. And when Obukaiya arrived there, there was 60 churches having revivals, going full bore Holy Spirit revivals. And um, so this is where uh, eventually the mission to Hawaii came out of Litchfield, out of this big revival area. And um, this is one of the, this is the last standing church. Uh, all the churches that Obukaiya went to have been burnt or, or torn down. And this is the, the only one that still is uh, active. 
So in 2019, um, I was a tour guide for a tour bus of 36 people from Hawaii, mostly native Hawaiian pastors and their wives. And we got to go inside here, and this is um, my friend Chauncey, and this is Keiki Aloha. Keiki Aloha is from Niihau. He lives out in Keikaha. He's a musical prodigy. And Chauncey's a descendant of Keopu Alani. She was Kamehameha's, she was the most, uh, the highest, she had the highest mana in all Hawaii, Kamehameha's sacred wife. And she was, the, back in Hawaii, she was the first uh, native Hawaiian to be baptized later in 1824. So we had these two significant guys leading worship inside this church. And we had a, a guy from the local historical society. I don't think he knew, knew what hit him when he started this worship service inside this church. So this is the, um, the main building of what was called the Foreign Mission School. And this opened in the summer of 1817. And basically it was a school for Obokaiya. He was the star pupil. But they had Tahitians, Malaysians, uh, Cherokee Indians, Choctaw Indians, a wide, wide group of uh, young men from, um, that came out of what they, they saw, saw what could be mission fields. And uh, this, again, this is our, our tour uh, in, uh, in, um, in, in, in Connecticut. This is the building where um, they had dinner. It was, you know, it, was, it was sort of like the anchor house. It was like the anchor house of uh, the foreign mission school where they did their laundry and so forth. Okay, so in order to go on a mission, um, in 1810, uh, an organization called the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions was formed in Massachusetts. And um, they began raising money and then selecting missionaries to go out. The first missionaries went out in 1812 and they went to India. And uh, the, the main uh, missionary's name was uh, Adonai, uh, Adonai Judson. And he ended up in Burma. And, he and his wife were in Burma. And things have changed so much. Um, they had the, uh, they would, they, they, had, they had monthly missionary magazines and it was sort of like the Netflix of the day. And they had these young American missionaries going all over the world. And people would avidly read these. They wait for them to come every month and read about the adventures of these young missionaries, you know, what happened next month. Because they would send letters back and it would take six months to a year for the letters to get back. So this is a report um, so to go on a mission, Obukaiya was to be the missionary to Hawaii with Samuel Mills, the, the founder of foreign missions in America. You had to go out for a year and, and go to churches and raise money to prove you were really committed to the mission. And this is a, an account of him being in Amherst, Massachusetts. Um, so the, um, the, the minister that invited him, who was an agent uh, of the American Board of Commissioners, um, would get up and sort of start the, start the service and uh, play up about how the savage became a Christian and so forth. And then Obukai would get up in the pulpit and start preaching in perfect English. And I mean, this was, you, you gotta, I mean, this was blowing people's minds in those days because they, they weren't sure that a you know, so-called savage could become a Christian generally. And then on top of that, he would... Um, read a passage of um, Genesis and Hebrew and then in the Hawaiian language that he translated. So by doing this, he sort of like broke the color barrier in New England and this really helped the anti-slavery movement too. So he, not, not just Hawaii, but he also um, helped uh, get the ball rolling on the, on the anti-slavery movement eventually leading to the Civil War. Okay. And here, here's a sample of his handwriting. And he loved to write letters, just like, you know, like you send emails and text. He was into letters. He'd write you know, four or five a day. And they are all over the place. Every time I go to New England, I find more of his letters. And most of them, he'd be, he'd be witnessing to the people that he met. Um, try some of those things here. Talking about you know, what the Lord was doing in his life and encouraging people in the Lord. And so he'd walk around New England, and he had a little pocket New Testament in his and. He'd like walk, see in those days, unless you had a, a horse, you had to have money to have a horse. And to have a carriage was really had a lot of money. So people walked. These guys would walk 30, 60 miles to go somewhere. And when, on the way, you'd see a farmer and he'd go up to him and start witnessing to him and say, 
Yeah, look at me, you know, I'm from, I'm from Hawaii. And what, what do I, I'm, I'm a Christian. How about you? Would you go to church? And, you know, so he, he'd confront people. Now, fortunately, um, there was a, a typhus epidemic broke out in New England around 1818 when he was preparing to become a missionary to Hawaii. And what typhus is, is um, it's fleas that come off a rat. Then they get on your dog or horse and they bite you and you get infected. So there's no antibiotics. It was, you know, you're, you're gone. If it, if it, you didn't recover. If it, if the fever didn't break, you, you were gone. And he was, um, because he was from Hawaii, his body wasn't totally acclimated to the, you know, the diseases in America. So unfortunately, he died. And this is his grave in uh, Cornwall. So if you go to the cemetery, this is the most notable grave there is there. It's raised. And the people in the town loved him so much that they, they had this big inscription made for him. And so for ever since that time, for 200 years, um, there's been pilgrimages to, the, to this gravesite. So that's the, the picture I showed you of myself. This is, you know, this is it, the same place. So I'm, I'm leading a tour the third week in October. I'm taking people from Hawaii to New Haven, and we're going to go up here to Cornwall, go to this gravesite. My friend, they disinterred his remains in 1993 and brought him back to Hawaii. So the, I'm friends with the archaeologist that did all the work, so he's going to come and give us a talk. And... Okay. So then um, this is about the development of his book. Um, they, they sent letters out and were asking for um, anybody that had letters that he wrote to send them to the mission school. So they put, put a book together about him. And then the, the book came, for, came out for sale around Christmas time in 1818. And the book took off, it became a bestseller. And then 1819 rolled around and all, all this, a lot of support, spiritual and financial support for the mission to Hawaii just took off. So his, in his death, he, he, he launched the mission to Hawaii. And then on October 23rd, 1819, um, the ship Thaddeus took off from Boston with the first company of missionaries to Hawaii. And, um, this is a little saying, for thousands of hearts will inter intercessions for your ascend daily to the throne of grace. Be faithful unto death, and may the mantle of Obakiah descend and rest upon you. Farewell. So these are the words they spoke over the, the, the 27 or so people that went out on the mission to Hawaii. Now, the, the, the ship was known as the Mayflower of the Pacific. So do you, what year did the pilgrims land in America? Anybody know? 1620. So these guys took off almost 200 years afterwards, right? <laughs> so, 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 they, so this was seen as, you know, the pilgrims came and brought the gospel to America in 1620. And then in 1820, they were, t they were moving the, the, you know, the tent pegs and moving it all the ways to, like, remember we, I told you about yesterday, the far ends of the earth. So they moved a mission out to the far ends of the earth. And so here, the Hawaiian uh, religion was a, a, you know, a, a compound of a bunch of Asian religions. So that's what happened spiritually here. You had the Asian religions and the pilgrim, the sons and daughters of the pilgrims came. So the gospel met the Asian religions here, the powerful you know, dark Asian religions. And that's, that's sort of, and then the spiritual battle started about the salvation of, of the Hawaiian nation. Okay. So when the missionaries, um, they started the first Sunday school class in Honolulu in 18, 1820, and they used the memoirs of Obakaya to, um, to, to um, in the Sunday schools to encourage uh, Native Hawaiians to be Christians. And this is Thomas Hopu. He was uh, the sidekick of Obakaya, and he worked with Sybil Bingham, the missionary wife, and she would read in English and he would translate into Hawaiian. And Obukai, and nobody knew about him in Hawaii. This was the first time they had ever heard about him. And the people, when they heard his story, the, people, the Hawaiians would start weeping when they heard his story. So eventually, uh, his memoirs are translated all around the world. And this was in, this was in French. And it was interesting, it was published in uh, Lausanne, Switzerland, which was the, the home of Calvinism, which, again, the, the missionaries that came here were, were Calvinist. And in 1867, um, a Hawaiian minister uh, translated the memoirs into the Hawaiian language and, and published that. So 
you know, so this, this, tw this 20 year old, this Hawaiian man that left when he was 20 years old and all these things happened to him and because he followed the Lord and that's why within a generation Hawaii became a Christian nation. Um, they brought printing, they brought literacy. Uh, we became the most literate nation in the world. 90% of native Hawaiians could read and write by, within a generation. I think Scotland was the only country that was, they, so people here were more literate than they were in America. Amazing things. And what happened, you know, it, was, it was expected that the missionaries would keep going to Asia. You know, this would be a, a stepping stone to Asia. But instead what happened, they stayed here, most of them. A couple of them went to Micronesia and Japan. And instead what the Lord's plan was, was to bring the people of Asia here to, with, for the sugarcane plantations. So, um, you know, in Japan, uh, I have friends that have been missionaries to Japan. Rick was about 1%, 2% people in Japan are Christians. But yeah, Rick's, Rick's uh, Ohana, her, his, his, uh, Lauren, his wife is Japanese American. And it's about 30% of the Japanese Americans in Hawaii are Christians. So, see what, so the plantations were used as an evangelism tool in a lot of ways. Many of the Chinese, even the, uh, many of the Filipino people that come here, they, um, they have become Protestants too. So that's, that's sort of what, yeah. But all of this goes back to this Obokai's decision to, to swim out to a, a ship, you know, and, and the Lord led him to do that, and then to be accepting, uh, acceptance of Christianity. So back in, in, when he arrived as a sailor, you know, he could have gone into the grog shops, he could have went on, gone on a ship and gone somewhere else, but he made these decisions in his life, to, to turned his life to the Lord. And imagine how, you know, he was um, st stuck out, out like a sore thumb, I'm sure, in New Haven, and there was a lot of prejudice against black people in those days too, even in Connecticut. So he faced a lot of those challenges too, but still, you know, he had, he's such, he, he had the spirit of aloha in him too. And he sort of loosened the churches up in New England too for bringing the Aloha spirit to New England. Yeah. Interesting life. I have a question. Sure. What's the spirit of Aloha? Spirit of Aloha? What's well, the spirit of Jesus Christ? You know? and really, it's lo loving other people and accepting them. Okay. So we had, uh, Hawaii became a state in um, 1959. So there was a minister at Kauai Hau Church in Honolulu, Reverend Abraham Akaka. And um, they, were, um, they were looking for a name for the state, like the Garden Islands, New Jersey, you know, your, your, whatever state you're from. What's, what's Alaska? Frozen? No. <laughs> no. I don't know, Alaska has something. <laughs> so he came up with, he, he put a legislative bill in to, to make it the Aloha state, but he defined Aloha as, as the spirit of Jesus Christ. That, that's a Hawaiian law. And if you look at the Hawaiian flag, have you guys seen the Hawaiian flag? What does it look like? It looks like, what, Great Britain, right? <laughs> they have the Union Jack in there. So what that is, that's different crosses. It's, um, which, which it was the, 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 the apostle that was crucified on a cross like an X. And, and then the, if you've watched uh, Queen Elizabeth's funeral, you see the, the white flag with the red cross. That's another part of it. That's St. That's, uh, George, the, drag, the dragon slayer. So even in our flag, we have Christian symbolism. And um, so in, in, uh, in, in my book here, you know, the last half of it, um, yeah, these are the pilgrims leaving from Holland in 1620. So they sort of had a missionary message from their pastor that when they get to New England, don't look at it as a as the last stop, but just a stepping stone to further places. And that's what happened when, um, 1820, when the missionaries came to Hawaii. But the last half of this, I show what was brought to, from America to Hawaii and how it became the foundation of our society. This is the Declaration of Independence. 1839, the Constitution of Hawaii, a Christian Constitution was formed based on this. Uh, the, the first hymns came from Tahiti, the Christian hymns, and that was the beginning of, you heard Hawaiian music, the ukuleles and the slacky guitars and stuff. You go back to the root of that is these, the hymns that the missionaries brought. <coughs> Western medicine, uh, the kahunas, some of them were doctors and they used herbal medicine, but when the Western diseases ca came, they couldn't, they couldn't, uh, they didn't have the power to combat them. 
So Western medicine came. Um, my wife wrote a book about Dr. Smith, who was the missionary doctor here in Kaloa, and they had a 1853, they had a smallpox epidemic. In Honolulu, it, it swept west of Honolulu. So from Honolulu to west of Oahu, half the native Hawaiians died from the smallpox. Here on Kauai and Niihau, Dr. Smith went or rode around on a horse, canoe, and foot, and inoculated everybody on Niihau on Kauai. And there was maybe one or two deaths here. Uh, okay, international trade. Uh, they brought law. The Hawaiians formed a court of law, Supreme Court. Temperance, anti-alcohol laws. Uh, they brought the Ten Commandments that became uh, the basis of law in Hawaii. And they brought Western education, which was really important. So if you look at all the you know, medicine, science, business, everything in Hawaii, the foundation, it all came from, it's all Christian. It all came from the, the Puritans of New England. And that's, Hawaii is a blessed place. It's one of the best, I think, best places in the world. And we have the fr freedoms we have, the prosperity we have here. It, it, it all goes back to, the, to Henry Obukaya, because he, he led the Christians to come here. Okay, does anybody have any questions about Henry or? No. Nope. Kind of one of those tragic stories of we didn't realize what was going to happen. I mean, you got to... do, you, do you want you want to come up in dialogue for a little bit? Yeah. Yeah, Henry, Henry, you know, he was all charged up. Imagine you think you're going to the mission field. You got all these people are going to support you. It's all going great. And all of a sudden, you get sick with typhus. And, you, and pretty much, you knew typhus was it, but it was a death penalty. Do not too many people walk from typhus. And so there it is, all that education, all that learning. All, all the desires to get back to his home country, especially to evangelize. And you can probably imagine laying in bed going, wait a minute, this isn't how this is supposed to end, right? And the fact that, that he put himself there, he says, I'm expendable. What he didn't know is what's amazing, what, what Chris was talking about, that because of him and that little book that he wrote, it became like a bestseller. And, and you know, millions of people have, have been over the years inspired by what he wrote. And they were just his memoirs, his thoughts, right? But that little book that was put together by Christian. Yeah, well, sort of a spiritual a spiritual yeah. diary is what it was, yeah. And people go, hey, they volunteered to take his place and, and probably did way more than he could have ever done by himself. Yeah, yeah, that's what they said, yeah. yeah. And when, when the missionaries left there, didn't they pack their stuff in a coffin? Not them, no, that was other guys, yeah. Other guys. Yeah. But when they came here, most of them were yeah. It's a long trip back home. Yeah. Yeah, so they sailed, um, they sailed 18,000 miles to get here, uh, 163 days at sea. And then not, they were all green sailors. None of them had been at sea before, except for the Hawaiians. The Hawaiians, were, they had no problem, yeah. And then they studied the Hawaiian language and the customs coming here. So when they landed on Kauai, I told you about Honi, where the you know, Hawaiians would, will share breath. And they were trained to do that. So when they met the king here, they all gave Honey the king, yeah. So they were, they're pictured as these really ignorant, you know, <laughs> dummies, hallies that come here, but they were, they were prepared. They, were, they, they knew some of the culture, yeah. Now, there's a lot of hostility towards the missionaries. I mean, when you read, when you read a lot of the modern press, um, you know, the book Hawaii by James Missioner was pretty hard on Hawaiians. Why? I mean, the, it's not coming from Hawaiian people, is it? Uh, no, well, James Missioner was an atheist, yeah, so it's an anti-Christian target, target, yeah. You know? And um, so, so the next generation, the support from, Mass from Massachusetts ended, so they had to go into business or leave. And so sugar cane plantations developed. But they weren't the majority owners of that. It was other businessmen that came in. And, um, and the uh, Hawaiian king rewarded the missionaries with like five acres of land, six acres of land, and things like that. And some of them, yeah, went into business and did become wealthy and so forth. So they're, so they, they're, they're descendants. Descendants, yeah, descendants. But it wasn't the original missionary. They had real pure intentions, yeah. yeah. And even when they got here, like, there's, you can imagine 40 years of sailors showing up in this place who were just using it as recreation. You know, the whorehouses, the drugs, and all that kind of stuff. And then when the missionary showed up um, and got the attention of the queens, and the kings, they began to lay down. Oh, shit, yeah, Kahumanu became, uh, was converted, yeah, but through the Tahitians, yeah. And they, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but one of them went to, uh, one of the missionaries was talking about the prostitution that was going on, and 
defense said, you know, that where we come from, this is illegal. They said, what? And so the Queen made it illegal. But what was the next day? Mad Jack Percival. Yeah, Percival, yeah. yeah. So he was, was, a, was an American war hero from the 1820s, and he, his boat was here in, in uh, Honolulu Harbor. What happened? Yeah, and they started, they bomb, started shooting cannonballs at the missionaries' houses and um, attacked them. And, uh, and the native Hawaiians beat them up, beat the sailors up. <laughs> they took care of them. So they, they were in favor of the missionaries. Yeah. Right. I, I think eventually they didn't even bring a group of Marines in and put their guns at the Queen and forced yeah, all kinds, of, Yeah, all kinds of things like that were going on, yeah. So there was a conflict was between whites who wanted to party, basically, yeah. and the and the Christians, the whites who came here, they brought beforehand for 40 years. They brought no medicine to speak of. They, they, you know, they brought plenty of disease and all the worst habits that you can imagine. A bunch of horny sailors showing up in the in the port, right? Hmm. And that was pretty much how things ran until so the missionaries yeah. came with a pretty impress with the language, understanding the well, culture, med- medicine, <laughs> medicine, and they went right to work with the regular people and 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 the Hawaiian people just you know wrapped their arms around them. Yeah, and what the uh, the population numbers were, were plummeting too when the missionaries came because of the uh, diseases, both um, things like the influenza and stuff, but mostly um, the um, venereal diseases that the sailors brought. And um, so the the Hawaiian culture was very um, loose as far as sexual mores went, and um, the missionaries saw the only way to um, save the Hawaiian people was to uh, cultivate Christian families. So when you hear things about, they didn't really, they didn't ban surfing, but surfing used to be like a nightclub. You go surfing and guys and girls would get together afterwards. And, and, uh, and the, the hula, the hula was, uh, there was a real pure hula, and then there was a real promiscuous hula that would entice, you know, everybody to have an orgy right. and stuff. So. Yeah, but uh, yeah, <laughs> not maybe that far, but yeah. So they, um, they, they warned about that, that to, to change those ways. Um, yeah, one missionary doctor and um, his records, so the, they weren't a, he wasn't a doctor, he was a missionary, but sort of the, her house became an emergency room. Uh, they had a section of the house of, with bandages and medicines and so forth. So when people were injured, they would come to the mission station for help. And he found um, signs of, of, uh, of uh, of, dis- of uh, communicable diseases, and 80% of the people that came, cl- including children, men, women, and children. Yeah. So that's what they had to, and the, there was a problem with infanticide, too. The, you know what infanticide is? When you take a baby, who's already alive, and kill it. Yeah, so Hopu, Thomas Hopu, who is uh, Obakai's uh, sidekick, so they called him Hopu because his mother had dug a hole and was getting ready to drop him in the hole and put rocks on top of it. When his aunt ra- ran up, and as, as she dropped him, he aunt caught him and ran away with him. So hopu means caught. It's like Moses. He's sort of like Moses in a way, yeah. And then he became a pretty real strong Bible teaching Christian when he got back. So there was a real dark side of things happening brought by the Western, Western you know, by the Western sailors, really. Yeah. So before, before Western contact, the Hawaiians didn't suffer these problems with, especially with the venereal diseases, but after Western contact, it was out of control. So if the missionaries hadn't come, possibly you know, the Hawaiian population really would have deteriorated. And, you know. A good chance on the reason there are pure Hawaiians is because of the missionaries. Yeah, so Niihau, the island we talked about somewhat. How many of you have seen Niihau? Have seen it? But you'll see it today. It's an island that sits yeah. It's privately owned. It was sold in the 1830s um, to some people from New Zealand. The king, the king over here, uh, pretty much lived on a different island. So he was into getting more stuff, more, more fancy clothes, and building himself a little palace. He looked at pictures of the of the royalty in Europe. So I, I, mean, I want some of that. You know, he wanted horses and carriages <laughs> and and to dress. I mean, when you look at the pictures, how they dress, they they modeled their dress. So I'm a king. I should dress like that too. And so all that stuff cost money. In order to get the money, because they didn't have much to, they didn't have much here to, to produce money. Um, he would sell off big chunks of land to, uh, to these guys are farmers from New Zealand. Yeah. So so the, the, they were the Kamehamehas. Like we were a separate country here on Kauai. So they had a battle, um, the coffee fields here in 1824, and then the Kamehamehas had total control of this place. So it, the valleys were called Ahu Pu'a. Um, the um, so there was about 30 or 40 of them on the island, and um, only one of them 
was bought by the Native Hawaiians up in the North Shore. The other ones, so we had absentee landlords, the Kamehamehas, and one by one they sold the valleys off to Western businessmen, basically, for sugar plantations and investments and so forth. So it wasn't, you know, the Hawaiian royalty sold the lands of Kauai. It wasn't, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, so a lot of stuff was going on here. A lot of when you have a clash of cultures and stuff like that. But what's particularly interesting is what happened when Christianity showed up. Everything got turned around. Yeah. So the, the one important thing too is um, so there was only two two full time missionaries, <laughs> and uh, they were in Waimea, and um, one of them came out of my ancestor's church in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. So my ancestors were sitting in church, and this teenage girl got up and said, I'm going to be a missionary to the Sandwich Islands. The, um, so what they did was, by the 1840s, there was a Bible school uh, right around the whole island. Even on the Pali Coast and Kalalau and Middle East, there were schools. And what they would do is they'd, they'd start a school up and pick out a couple of students that were the star students and train them really well and move them to the next village. And they would start a school. And they would, find, they would move on or they'd find other students. And so all the schools were native Hawaiian taught. There were native Hawaiian Bible teachers. And the whole island was circled. And the, the late 1830s uh, was called the, Great, Revi the Great, Awa Great Revival in Hawaii. And uh, there was a church in Hilo on the big island. And th the congregation within the town was 10,000 Hawaiians. And there was eight or 9,000 more on the out outskirts of it. It was the, the largest Protestant congregation in the world. The whole world. The whole world, yeah. You know, I, that's, that's all traced back to this one character you've been hearing about today, this one Hawaiian kid, who by all rights should have been dead you know, with, his, with his family. Uh, but God stepped in, and then unbeknownst to him, decided to use him, uh, use him by taking him home early. You know? yeah. He became expendable in God's hands in order that the gospel would go out. So, that's why he's kind of a rock star. Because he, he knows now he's a rock star, but he didn't know then he was a rock star. <laughs> you know? Which is kind of how it works in Christianity. You think you're a rock star now, you're probably screwed. You know? <laughs> but if you if you realize, hey, I'm, I'm expendable to God, however he wants to use me, then you'd be really amazed what mm -hmm. takes place. Yeah. Some of it completely outside of your, your sight. Your yeah. Sight. So anyway, just wrapping this up, my own life though, you know, I, I got the word about this in 1983 and I had to write about 20 books, secular books, and, uh, and worked 20 years in journalism and on and on and on until I was able to write this, until I felt I was qualified enough to write this. And since I've done this, you know, I was faithful to what the Lord gave me to do. And my life, I mean, <laughs> it's crazy where I'm, places it's put me. I'm, I'm on a trustee of the missionary descendants. I'm, Invited to Yale for a week. I mean, and basically, you know, we're we're surfers on, from yeah. Kauai, you know, basically, really, right? <laughs> so, again, you know, God's kind of using this whole thing to counter as a counterweight against the negative publicity of the Hawaiians that the missionaries get, uh, particularly here in yeah. Hawaii, and uh, and even in surfing. I mean, uh, for a long time, if you were in the surfing culture, the narrative was. The, the uptight Hawaiians came, uptight missionaries came to Hawaii and made everybody stop surfing, okay? And, the, and so the idea was uh, missionaries were hostile to surfing um, and we had to rejuvenate it, take, you know, take it away from the uptight Christians. But Chris's research found out that that was not true at all. In fact, when the first white guy, uh, Nihau, was a surfer. Well, that was 1890, but it wasn't much longer. But yeah, some the... Um yeah, again, they were, so the Hawaiians used to gamble a lot, too. They loved gambling, so they would have got to have a surf off, and they would bet on the surfers, and they would bet their house, their, I mean, their wife sometimes, things like, and it would destroy their family. So, the, so that's the one reason the missionaries came down on that aspect of surfing was that. But they, didn't like, they didn't dislike surfing in and of itself. No, no, the, no. So, so um, my first research trip to uh, New England, <laughs> So I, I'd found this, these missionary magazines. One of them had a surfing story about Hiram Bingham and King Kamuli'i surfing, watching surfing at Waimea here on Kauai. So I spot the, spotted this decades ago, and, and then eBay came on, and I found a copy. And then uh, the surfer, Randy Rarick, we had a Quicksilver Hawaiiana uh, surfing memorabilia auctions in Hawaii. So I, I, put, I got it for $3 on eBay. <laughs> and then I went over to Honolulu, 
and I put a hundred dollar reserve on it. You know, I figure I get a hundred bucks, it'd be great. I can buy some more of these now. And the thing is sold for thirty three hundred dollars, um, and and some surfing collector in California bought it. So I used, I took that money, and I went and the the words of the missionary, and I it, it funded my research trip about Obukaya in New England. So. So the actual narrative is that actually were missionaries with the Hawaiian kids. Yeah, later, yes, yeah, later on, yeah. So you know the whole idea that the Hawaiians that the, surf, that the, surf, that the missionaries killed surfing was a false narrative. So I, I worked for Surfer Magazine at the time, and I went to, I went to the publisher of it and said, and presented uh, some of Chris's research and said, hey, this would make a great story about how we got this thing wrong, you know, for years, for decades, and you could, you know, introduce this correction that, hey, no, the missionaries weren't uptight about it, they actually served themselves, <coughs> and all I got was crickets. They, they didn't want to talk to me about it. Mm. Even to this day, they don't want to. Yeah, okay, so, so on Niihau, um, the, um, the, the Robinson family were Presbyterians. They, they, were, they had a church, and the whole island sort of revolved around the church. And what they did over there, they, they met, there's about 12 family names, the basic names there, and they, they took stones, and they carved the family's names on the stones, and they circled the church. So... Because the, the, the sailors didn't go there, they didn't have the drinking, didn't have the sexual problems, a lot of the Hawaiian crafts and, 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 and games and things pr were preserved. So in 1890, um, a researcher from Columbia University came in, in Honolulu, he asked him, I want to see real Hawaiian surfing. And he said, you have to go to Niihau, right? So he went over in a canoe with big glass plate photography stuff and took photos of the Hawaiians over there. And that's the earliest uh, photos of, of Hawaiian surfing. But the reason why it was preserved was because of Christianity. Their lives weren't based on uh, you know, worldly drinking and so forth or the partying aspect. And they were based on, it was a pure island. And um, yeah, so that's a good example of that. Thanks, Chris, for sharing yeah. that.